Hardware to Save a Planet explores the technical innovations that are giving us hope in the fight against climate change. Each episode focuses on a specific climate challenge and explores an emerging physical technology solution with the person bringing it into reality. I'm your host, Dylan Garrett. Hello and welcome to Hardware to Save a Planet. I'm here with Ben Parker, the co-founder and chief product officer of Lightship. Ben and his team are designing an electric and aerodynamic solar-powered recreational vehicle, or RV. A really cool RV for short. A really cool RV for short, thank you. Normally when I think of RVs, speaking of, I picture that big white box on wheels that my grandparents used to cruise around the country in. But if you're listening to this, you have to go to lightshiprv.com and check it out because their product is very much not that. It is very cool. And I want one. I have to admit, though, that initially I wasn't sure how it was relevant to climate change on a big scale. But I was super surprised to learn that in North America, over 11 million households own an RV and 500,000 of them are sold here every year. And because towing a traditional RV kills your vehicle's range, RVs cause an increase in gas usage and they make it less likely that owners will switch to EVs where range anxiety is already an issue without the reduction caused by towing. Lightship is solving that range problem, which could accelerate EV adoption along with delivering what looks to be a really awesome product. Before Lightship, Ben worked as a mechanical engineer at Tesla, designing batteries in the Model 3. And then during COVID, he went on a 6,000-mile cross-country RV trip, which sounds to me like a pretty good way to research an RV startup. I'm really excited to hear more of that story. So, Ben, thanks a lot for being on the show. Yeah, Chris, don't. That was a really awesome synopsis of what we're doing and where some of the impact is. Cool. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it's impact in cheap clothing, where the, the clothing is, is a beautiful, modern, aerodynamic, all-electric travel trailer. I mean, might as well look cool while you're doing it. Well, yeah. And I think part of it too is that, especially when it comes to the consumer side, uh, well, consumer behaviors and the way that we as consumers live our lives, we make buying decisions and lifestyle decisions. Yes, with big macro ideas like what's happening to the climate and our, our impact on it in mind, but also with an eye to what we love doing and who we love doing it with. And like you said, RVing is huge. It's 10% of the country, believe it or not, one in 10 American families owns and uses an RV. And that's one of the, like, the key ways that they get outdoors and experience the outdoors. And it's a big part of a lot of people's identity as well. If you're an RVer, you're really, you are an RVer. So there's a deep culture behind it and that's not going to stop. So I think we, especially as someone coming from more of an engineering and a technical background, I think of it as we need to solve this problem of carbon emissions and what it's doing to the environment by sort of finding the answers that don't disrupt fundamentally our way of life. It's a little idealistic to say that we're going to engineer our way out of all of our problems. There, there are behaviors and, and ideals that we all need to keep and sometimes adapt to live in a more sustainable way to talking on the, on the century long scale. But I think there's a lot that we can do to solve some immediate problems through good product development work. Again, when it comes to how we as consumers live every day. Yeah. I know you spent some time at Tesla and I mean, my take on it is Tesla kind of has shown the impact of that way of thinking, right? Like electric vehicles existed before Tesla, the technology has been there for a while, but they made this thing, they made a better product, arguably, or at least a product people wanted uh, this desirable thing. And it sounds like in some ways that same. That becomes, that the engine for change, right? It is in making something that, something that's just as good or better and is more sustainable or more green to boot. That's the unlock, I think, to rapid transformation. Right. And I think that rapid is a key word there, right? Like the speed of the adoption. If you think about just how the scale of adoption we need to have in electric vehicles and electrification generally, like that, it's an area under the curve problem, right? Every little bit of change we can have now will pay dividends over time. So the, the accelerating that adoption is super important. Yeah, and where cultural values and belief systems are changing on the multi-generational and multi-century scale, we need to find ways to move faster than that. And I think that means coming up with clever ways to adapt what is already core to our lifestyle to be, to combat the issue. I do want to rewind a bit to your background and just oh, yeah? your, your story of how you got to this role and got to founding Lightship, because I, 
you have this great kind of overview of, of it on the website, but I think it'd be fun for, I'd like to hear it in your words and for our listeners to hear it. So I understand you were at Tesla designing batteries and the Model 3, you're a mechanical engineer. First of all, that was a really exciting time to be at Tesla, I imagine. It was a really wild time to be at Tesla. I, I, yeah, I feel like I lived a couple automotive careers in it <laughs> in a few years. But it'd be great to show for it now. It was wild. It, we So yeah, I guess a little bit about, about my story. I grew up a car nut. I grew up on the, the East Coast in Massachusetts. I'm a I'm an Antucketer, an island boy. My dad and grandpa both have colonial style bed and breakfasts out there. So I was a you know, grew up the son of an innkeeper on a, an island 30 miles out to sea. And I spent a lot of time in the auto shop growing up in high school because there was actually a really great vocational programs at high school there. And so I spent a lot of time working on my own car growing up. I wrote my college entrance essay about my car. It was a 1999 black Audi A4. And I basically chose, not entirely, but in, in large part chose to go to the school that I went to for university because there was this amazing formula student racing team and just loved it. And that that ultimately was a stepping stone for me to to get a job at Tesla. I was interning at Tesla for a few years while I was still in school. And I somewhat by happenstance landed in in Tesla's battery technology group. I could I could tell that battery technology was going to be a big thing. This would be a, a really impactful technology for humanity this century. Got to figure out a way to store electricity better. I worked with some brilliant people there. And my job there for about five years, like you said, I, I was a battery engineer. So I went from R&D into product development. I was working as one of the design engineers for the battery pack, worked for on the Model 3 for several years. And it was a big moment in Tesla's history because it was Tesla going from producing ones and tens of thousands of cars, sort of low volume. This is with the Roadster and on the Model S and the Model X to going mass market and building their first high volume vehicle, which was the Model 3 and the Model Y, its sibling. And Tesla hadn't done that before. And so there were a ton of things that we did many more things wrong than ultimately <laughs> right. But that was where so much of the learning came from, was learning how to mass manufacture a car for the first time, which I feel really lucky that I got to see and be a part of because it was just so cool to see. We went for full automation up front and that was lights out manufacturing where the materials come in one side of the factory and the cars roll out at the other side of the factory. It didn't go quite like that. We, for a time, this is all happening in through my eyes in Reno, Nevada at the first Gigafactory. So this was Tesla's first big battery and powertrain factory out, out in the desert. There, those powertrains were then shipped to Fremont where the cars were assembled. We basically went back to like Henry Ford, Bottle T style production, hand building the powertrains for a while just to be able to produce enough of them. Because Tesla was, this was 2018. So at that point, Tesla was kind of in the hole with a lot of capital deployed to get this mass market car program off the ground and not a lot of volume of vehicles shipped to, to show for it at that point, which is a risky financial position to be in for a business to, to state the obvious. And it was a great experience. We ultimately got through production hell. We ramped the Model 3 production line. I then came back to the headquarters in, in California in Palo Alto and started working on the next generation battery design. This is what is now going into the Cybertruck or a, a version of it. It's using Tesla's in-house produced battery cell, which was a milestone for the company. They'd before that been sourcing battery cells from other manufacturers. And I was really kind of back into that work and loving doing new development. And then I, but I had a little more time on my hands being off of the production floor. And so I picked up a new pet project where the idea was to electrify all of the food trucks in the Bay Area because my many of my coworkers and I would eat at a one of a rotating circuit of food trucks that came to the headquarters every day. And they all run these either propane or gasoline generators to run their, their operation and cook and serve food. I could not stand yelling over those generators every day. And the irony of Tesla power walls and all this great energy, these sort of clean energy technology existing on the other side of the wall. And then there's ripping generators out in the parking lot every day. Just, it <laughs> got to me. So I started working on that on the side where the idea was, okay, how do we electrify these trucks? At least when they're sitting still for eight or nine months. This is 2019. I was doing this with a friend. While working at Tesla. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. literally... <laughs> I don't talk about this part that much, but if you want the truth, it was like me out during the lunch hour 
I order a panini. I'm talking to Graziano, let's say, one of the food truckers. And then I'm going around the back and we're both like staring into the bowels of his food truck, looking at the generator and figuring (laughs) out how do we replace this thing? It was pretty fun. It was actually a great, great project. And it's actually from that food truck project that kind of morphed into electric RVs because I would tell people about the food truck idea and RVs would often come up in conversation with them because there are many similar needs in electrifying an RV, just as with a food truck, running a bunch of home appliances on board. The key difference being that food trucking is kind of a cottage industry. It's very segmented and lots of small operators who are not flush with cash versus RVing is this enormous luxury pastime that a really big part of the country takes part in and loves. It's really a part of Americana at this point. And so I got pretty excited about that. And Toby, my co-founder and I, who I would meet a couple months later, had both been thinking about this big idea of where was electrification going to go next in ground transportation. So what if it was happening in passenger cars, what would the next wave of electrification look like? Because we both have devoted our careers to, to EVs and love working on these products. And so basically it, it all clicked. COVID came, we all got locked down and I was like everybody else cooped up in my apartment for a few weeks and decided to take the risk and, and go for it. And so left Tesla at that point, I rented a 30 foot Winnebago motorhome, a big mini Winnie, I call it a class C motorhome where it's, so it's a drivable RV as opposed to a towable. But turns out most RVs are towable. It's about 90% of the market is something, a trailer that you'd pull behind a truck. And it's a small fraction that are, are self-driving things anywhere from a van up to a, a converted bus in terms of the size. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't have a pickup truck at the time either. And so I, I rented a motor home and I took it for it was so good to get out of the apartment and get get onto the road. And I actually, growing up on an island, I hadn't gotten to do that much RVing growing up. I loved road tripping and the outdoors and all that. But I knew that I was simultaneously soul searching from having just done a a pretty intense five years at at Tesla and then kind of market research, market researching as, as well. And I just got super into it. I spent about three months on the road. I did, like you said, it was about a 6,000 mile trip in total. And I talked to a ton of RVers along the way about what, both how they go RVing and also what electrification would mean for the pastime. Like what if you didn't have to deal with gas generators and propane cans and carbon monoxide sensors and this hodgepodge of, of systems that people need to string along today to make a home on wheels work. And I came back to the Bay Area totally convinced that there was one, a big opportunity here from market size standpoint and the impact you can associate with that and two that the it was a lifestyle that people really love that was begging for change Mm -hmm. a lot of unmet kind of needs there that that the current products were not serving well how much was climate change impact on your mind at that time or did you just see this is a big opportunity i can make a better product yeah i wasn't thinking so i was holding both in mind at the same time, again, because I think you need a compelling, in this case, consumer product to drive the change. The scale I knew would associate to the large impact as well. And I think what, I mean, what I've come to learn over, or really Toby and I have together realized over time is that there's, there's awesome direct impact in electrifying and making more sustainable the RV itself. But to your point earlier, so much of the impact is sort of indirect and has ripple effects as well, because for instance, the pickup truck is the best selling vehicle class in America by many fold. There are, there's a million Ford F-150s alone that, that get sold every year. And none of those trucks are going to be able to go effectively electric as manufacturers are already starting to do if you can't do typical truck stuff with them. And towing is like pretty important, the classic use case of a truck. And so to re-architect or redesign the RV to be compatible with electrification, I could see it was going to be a gateway or it's an enabler of the electrification of the pickup truck. So I can see there was another eddy of electrification that impact that you could have just thinking about vehicles more broadly. The cool thing that I realized over time too, from having talked now with thousands of RVers and early, early customers of ours is realizing that there's I think the electrification of something like an RV is a really interesting milestone towards the true mainstreaming of an all electric life that we all will live. There's now kind of a well-worn stereotype around who bought EVs in the early days. They're it's the coastal person who's buying a Tesla for the first time. And there's a whole bunch of stereotypes that we could draw from it. Many of them false, some of them true. 
And I think what's really important for electrification to have a real impact is that it has to be truly mainstream and have broad base adoption. And if you think about the core of the RV market, there's a huge legacy market of people who are later adopters. They're more conservatively minded buyers. And that is just such a great opportunity, I think, to make inroads with electrification to a, a demographic of people who have not already had a great electric product built for them. And because to make it a little more concrete, if you think about, let, let's say that you buy a light ship, it's your first electric vehicle ever. You're still towing it with your gas truck at that point. Let's say it's a gas Ford. And then maybe three years down the road, the Ford F-150 Lightning 2.0 is out and you're like, okay, I think this might be the one for me. And part of the reason why I think it's the one for me is because I got the L1 a couple of years ago and I know the two are going to be compatible. So that's not a problem for me. And then when you go into, this is a vacation home on wheels. So when you go into the product, think about all of the other verticals of electrification within an individual person's life. Home electrification, for instance, where you've got gas furnaces that will over time be replaced by electric heat pumps. You have propane burners where I think a lot of people will be installing induction cooktops instead over time. These are all new technologies for your, for a homeowner. And you're not necessarily going to want to just jump into those. If it's your house, the probably the most expensive purchase that you ever made. But if you have familiarity with those sorts of things like induction cooktops and heat pumps from your light ship and from using them in your light ship already, the stakes are way lower when your furnace fails and you got to replace like it's time to replace the heating system or your propane cooktop goes out and you're like, okay, actually we could put an induction cooktop in there. We love it from the light chip. So I think there's the seeds of a more sustainable lifestyle and one that is, all, is built through great product experiences in attacking electrification of the RV. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I mean, essentially with one purchase, somebody could be adopting electric transportation, electric HVAC, electric cooking, all of those barriers. Yeah. Think about even solar systems as well, where mm -hmm. people are going to have to decide to put solar battery systems on their home for to save money every month and the energy bill, get some energy resilience at, at your house too. The light ship, it turns out, is there's a large enough solar system on the roof of this vehicle and a big enough battery in the floor. So it's something like six Tesla power walls worth of energy in the floor of a light ship. They, as the thing is parked probably in your driveway or your side yard or your backyard for most of the year, you can use it as your home solar system as well. And you can even get a tax credit on the solar and battery. Oh, really? Of, yeah, same as you would get if you were to install this at your house. So there's things like that where you may have been thinking about putting in a solar system at some point. You knew you loved RVing and, this, and so you were going to get one at some point and ends meet. Wow, six power walls worth of energy storage? Yeah, wow. a lot. I mean, depending on how much you're running your appliances during a blackout or something like that, you can get at least multiple days of runtime just running your home off of an L1. I didn't say this earlier, but the my understanding is part of that energy go, or part of the electric energy usage is for cooking and heating and cooling while you're using the RV, but also for towing. The way you solve the range problem is you actually the, the RV has a motor itself, the unelectric motor that is acts as an assist, I guess. So the towing weight is reduced. The towing weight for the towing vehicle is reduced. So it doesn't impact the vehicle range. Right. Or the fuel economy for that matter. It's a little bit like an e-bike almost in the sense that it the trailer E assists the truck that's pulling it. And so the truck doesn't feel the weight of the trailer anymore and thus does not lose range for, for fuel economy for up to about, about 300 miles, which is a pretty long day. One thing I was curious about, I'm my understanding, I've done a little bit of research into the RV market just in preparation for this. It looks like there are two big incumbents, which kind of split 80% of the market, Forest River and Thor Industries. Are they also doing this? And if not, why not? Yeah, we know, well, I should say, actually, we're psyched that we just closed another funding round just before the new year. And oh, nice. we're, this is our, our Series B. We're lucky to have one of those two major RV manufacturers coming in as an investor in this round. Well, I'm sure there's, there's Thor Industries investing through TechNexus, one of their investment partners. They definitely know that electrification is coming. They've done a concept of an electrified trailer via Airstream, which is one of their brands. And... I think they're psyched about what we're doing because it's pretty damn hard to build an electric vehicle from scratch. It's hard to build any new type of vehicle ground up. It requires a team with a lot of inspiration and a really clear vision for what needs to happen. There's also 
a ton of technical expertise and sort of depth of supply chain knowledge required to build a great new EV from scratch. And like billions of dollars, right? I, I was going to ask this too, right? Like a typical R&D budget for a new vehicle is on the order of billions of dollars, isn't it? Yes and no. This is a beautiful thing about building a company like ours in the 2020s. If you were a Tesla 15 years ago, there was no supply chain for electrification components since you were forced to build down to the itty bitty parts, everything yourself. And that that is certainly a multi-billion dollar exercise. We have the benefit of sort of standing on the shoulders of giants in the sense that global automotive has invested yeah, at least tens, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars into electrification over the past decade, let's say. And so some of the most capital intensive things that we would have to do if we were building everything from scratch, we do not have to do anymore. Think about the battery pack, for instance. At some point, we may build our own battery pack from scratch. Right now, we have the benefit of using our expertise, using our contacts, and going out and sourcing a great, durable, low-cost kind of automotive-grade battery pack from a supply chain. Much of the challenge we face is it's software and embedded hardware to sort of control all this stuff and tie everything together to work in a new way, namely to bring together home stuff plus EV stuff and then make that all work together. So the cool upshot there is that we don't need to raise a billion dollars to put a significant number of these vehicles in people's hands. And this is not global automotive. So think about from a manufacturing standpoint too, we're at significant click down in volume for the first flagship product versus something like a Corolla. So we don't have to build a multi-billion dollar factory to get this done. We can do it in a, a less extreme way. That's great because it creates real inroads for us to to build this without having to go to that extent. There's a lot of vision which applies to the product and also to how this business will operate and a lot of technical expertise required to pull this off in a great way. And we think pretty uniquely, we've built it now a, approaching a 60 person team of people who in background and in mentality, and that, that includes the culture that we're cultivating here, are we have the DNA to do that. And is that relationship with Thor then strategic in the sense that you're able to leverage their access to suppliers, their industry knowledge, things like that? Or what does that look like? Still to be announced and determined, but we think they're going to be a really valuable partner of ours over time. They know the RV industry like no other too, which is great. Yeah. Cause I imagine as a newcomer to a, such an established industry with such clear incumbents, it, is it, it might be challenging to get attention from some of the suppliers you want to work with and that kind of thing. Is that the case? Yeah, we've gotten a really awesome response. Honestly, we've gotten a good response from a lot of suppliers who have traditionally do business in the RV industry too. So I wouldn't knock that. I think there's a bunch of details though and kind of relationships that are set up throughout the industry on, on how this all works. And we're bringing a new set of ideas to the space as well. We also want to be able to empathize really deeply with sort of the mainstream RV customer and know what people are thinking or, or expect who have RV'd all their lives. And I think there's a great chance to do it through that sort of partnership. So we're, we're psyched to have them. What are the kind of business challenges ahead of you? What, what do you think is going to be hard about scaling the business? Production is incredibly hard, is the reality. I think we've done a pretty great thing in building a product concept and a proof of that concept that people are really excited about. And are, in fact, many are so excited that and want one so badly that they're putting down the dollars to get a spot in line. As a reservation, there's yet another level of challenge or a couple levels in turning this into a real product it means one that's going to last a generation ideally and is easy to assemble can be done for the right cost the right weight all of those things there's a lot of details to work out there to go from prototype to a durable product that meets all of our requirements and everything that a customer would expect of them to be able to produce that in an efficient way and then to build a great customer experience around that. So good service infrastructure, people who answer the phone and like you as, a, as an owner or a customer know you're being taken care of. There's a lot to do there, make that right. And I would say generally that's kind of the new phase of the business that we're in here is we made something that we know people love and are lusting after. Now we need to operationalize the business to deliver it. And that makes 2024 pretty exciting. And also probably at times sleepless. <laughs> You're more worried about it's going to be harder to meet the demand with supply than it is to create the demand. Yeah, we're kind of chasing demand right now. We have more shown already than 
we had perhaps initially planned that are now so figuring isn't... out ways to build more of these faster. Cool. Good problem to have. Yeah. No, it's great. On the engineering side, it, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is you're able to integrate off the shelf or existing components from suppliers. Are there places where you've really had to innovate as an engineer in the hardware space? Yeah. <laughs> I wish on many days that it were so easy as, as buying stuff off the shelf and, and it all goes together perfectly. Most, but a very large fraction of the parts by part count are on the light ship are custom and are, are to us. So think about the body, the chassis. Sometimes we'll rely on a supplier to build to our design. Think about like a, the chassis, for instance, those frame rails is a good example of that. But there's still a lot of customization and sort of mechanical design work required there. There's a ton on the kind of software and controls front, like I talked about, to make it effectively a home solar system, a bunch of consumer electronics and appliances, an EV powertrain, motor, battery, and EV power electronics all work well together, has not been done before. And the deeper you get into it, the more you realize there are lots of challenges at the boundaries of those things. So like, we'll try to use some of the electronics from a car, like the same thing that you use to charge the car battery to run a microwave as well, because that's a good, efficient way to do it. Maybe it doesn't like that microwave and the microwave shuts the electronics down and then you need to figure out, okay, how do we need to change the circuit or change how the controls work to actually make that happen. That is one of, probably at this point, thousands of examples of things like that, where making these disparate systems work together requires a lot of good circuit design and good controls work. The one that I would call out in particular is that powertrain that we talked about, where we have an e-assist or you could call it a range assist. It's a propulsion system built into the trailer. That's novel. It's required a lot of hardware and software and controls development to make it one work and two, any more important, be safe in sort of in all scenarios. It needs to be what in the auto industry you'd call functionally safe. The same reason that when you press the accelerator pedal on your car, you know it's only going to do one thing. When you do that, there's a lot of work that goes into you knowing that with such certainty. We're tackling similar challenges and building this new type of range assisting system for a trailer to make sure that it's just bomb proof safe. Here's about that. Is there comms between the trailer and the car? Or is it? We actually do it. It's really interesting. There are maybe two ways that, that two obvious ways that, that we saw you could go about this problem of extending your truck's range. One of them was we could have put a battery on the trailer and then you have another one in the truck and you could connect those batteries together and make the truck and the trailer communicate with each other electronically. The other way is like just give the truck more range with a bigger battery. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Right. And just send the power up to the truck. The other way big obvious way to do it would be we could put a whole separate powertrain on the trailer and including a motor on the trailer and actually decouple the vehicles from one another. So instead of having to have lots of digital communication between the vehicles, we could just do kind of physical sensing between the truck and the trailer. We thought about it for a bit and the obvious answer to us was to take the latter approach. We basically, we build the system to be agnostic to whatever make and model or even type of powertrain the truck would have. So you, it should work whether or not it's an EV truck or a gas truck. When you put a powertrain in the trailer, that works. We didn't want to, we're a startup that needs to do this in a couple of years because that, that's the pace and time scale of a, of a startup. If we had decided to wait on an automotive standard to emerge, to have every truck produced by every manufacturer of vehicle communicate with a trailer, we would be very old. Right. And Lightship would not exist anymore by that point. So. What we ended up doing, which I think you find it interesting, is we put a force sensor between the truck and the trailer. So you're sensing whether the trailer is trying to push the truck or pull the truck. And when it's pulling the truck back, which is most of the time, the controller then tells the motor to spin up and help a little bit. So it reduces the force between the two. And then if you're ever slowing down or you're going downhill or a variety of conditions, the trailer wants to push the truck. Now... You kill the power to the motor, or you could even turn on regen so that the trailer is sort of keeping a light tension between itself and the truck and even towing more stably behind it. And you get the benefit of putting more energy back into your light ship battery so you get to camp with more runtime. Yeah. No, and to your point about speed of adoption, that's seems like the only way to do it. It's also the climate imperative. 
like we talked about, like all this stuff needs to happen fast. That's a tall order when you're talking about a, uh, like a 50 gigatons problem. We've got, that is a lot of carbon to, to either attempt to pull out of the atmosphere or stop putting into the atmosphere. And yeah, the tough thing about working with hardware and working with atoms is that it, it wants <laughs> to be slow. <laughs> inertia, inertia shows up everywhere. And uh, so we're, we're doing everything we can to move fast and be, be efficient and overcome that. Yeah. What's your vision for the future of Lightship? How much of an impact do you think the company could have? What kind of time scale does that look like? Well, I think 20 years out or so, I and Toby both, first off, we want Lightship to be the reason that people remember that RVing went electric, that that'd be an amazing legacy to carry it, where people think about, oh yeah, then Lightship came and then RVing quickly turned into a, a, more, a greater and greater electrified pastime. We care a lot about not only bringing the best of electrification to new new demographics of people, but also to kind of keep expanding the, the accessibility or the availability of RVing to more and more people who want to try it or want to do it. So I think to, there's ways that we can do that through the product, through designing a really accessible product or one that's easy to use, doesn't require a ton of education up front, or we are, we're doing a really good job of educating people who are going RVing for the first time on how to use it. I think there's also, we just realized that there are a lot of it's like the more RVing we do, the more you realize there are a lot of challenges to going RVing that are inherent to the product. There are just as many, if not more, around the broader experience of going RVing and owning an RV. It's, it's stuff like, where the heck am I going to stay on the third night of this trip? I can't get into a state park or the one that I want to because every site is booked out and has been for, for six months. It's the times when you're not going RVing or vacationing with it. It's where the heck am I going to store this thing, there's a whole bunch of challenges in the present day sales and service experiences that I think we can improve on. And so we think ultimately about how do we make for end to end travel experience or a comprehensively better RV travel and ownership experience. And yeah, you'll see more and more from us over time about how we're going to do that and make this something that more and more people can do and enjoy. Cool. So the scope of your impact could go beyond the RV itself to the whole experience of RV. Yep. The goal is we want to be your ultimate travel partner here. And, and I guess the cool thing kind of tying it back to this idea of impact as well is that there are, you talk about the 50 gigatons of carbon out there, a significant fraction of that. I think it's, I think it's approaching five is, is related to travel, generally speaking. So to create a sustainable and more local travel alternative, and especially for people who who want to get out in nature and enjoy it is that is the impact that I think is there for us to grasp if we can build the business right. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. I'd buy it. Okay. So I have three last questions that I ask everybody. Hit me. The first is how optimistic or pessimistic are you about the future of the planet and why? <laughs> you probably sense that I'm kind of an optimist. <laughs> it's unavoidable for me, but I think we have a really hard say next hundred years out of us. I also think that just broadly speaking, human beings and our species will to survive is very strong. It's like unassailably strong. And I don't think that the challenges that confront us right now are greater than that, that will for us to survive. I also think that we are social beings who crave love more than aggression. And I think that that kind of holds true through history and it's going to keep being that way. So I think we're going to be okay. But I also think that the thing that's really tough about something like climate change has been said before is that it's happening on a time scale that doesn't is really hard for each of us to work through it's just long enough that we can't treat it as a fight or flight scenario it's not like something that we can fix immediately or that we need to quote unquote react to immediately but it's also happening fast enough that we need to make changes in the way that we're living that are enormous on this time scale it's an insidious challenge that's a good way to put it who is another company or individual doing something to address climate change right now that's inspiring you? And there's a million. We talked about Heirloom at the start, so it's front of mind for me. They're a really cool carbon capture company that I can't explain exactly how they their technology in depth. Here, I won't do it justice, although I think, I think Secretary of Energy just did a nice profile on them and, and this Jane Grand home and gave them a cool spotlight. I, you and I both don't know a couple of the people there, like Noah and Juhi. Those are good people doing great work. Yeah, totally. Big fan of Heirloom. Noah was... One of the early episodes, so for anyone listening, check that out. They did a good job uh, describing what they're up to. What advice do you have for someone not working in climate today who wants to do something to help? Yes. 
Well, I think the cool thing is that climate is and climate work is kind of becoming cool. There's more of our infrastructure behind it to help help draw people in. I mean, frankly, what, what we're doing right now is part of that. I think I talk sometimes or we hear stories from Andrew Beebe, who's he's at Obvious Ventures now. He's a really great long, long time climate investor. And he was around he was like working at solar in the 2000s. He was around for climate tech 1.0, as they called it, you know, around the time of the recession. And so he's seen a couple cycles of this. And yeah, he'll tell you that the amount of money and attention that is going into work on climate change right now is totally unprecedented and is a, is creating a lot of great channels in. I don't know if you know the folks at, at My Climate Journey as well. They're great investors of ours and have supported us for a long time. And I think I have some really good kind of educational channels and materials and, and a built a community around getting more involved in climate to Terra.do is a, is a really cool, cool recruit, more like recruiting oriented or career oriented groups that we've worked with them in the past and as a way to think about careers in climate. I think that a thing that's really great about the climate community is there's such a shared sense of mission here and there's there's such kind of high level alignment around why we're all doing this and that creates a lot of openness among people who are embedded in or are leaders in in this work too. And so I think for people who are trying to transition more into or get closer to what's happening in climate, you'll meet a lot of openness in the people who've been doing this work for a while because this is kind of like a humanity-wide project we've got here. And so Big Tent is the only approach that will work for us. Totally. I've found that too. Awesome. We'll put some links in the show notes to those resources. MCJ and Terra.do are both really good. Cool. Ben, that was really fun. Thanks for your time and thanks for what you're doing. I'm excited to hopefully get my light ship sometime in the future. <laughs> we will be working day and night to get it for you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Appreciate you guys for reaching out to us. This was fun. Hardware to Save a Planet is brought to you by Synapse. To find out more about us and how we develop hardware solutions for the world's most ambitious companies, head to synapse.com. And then make sure to search for Hardware to Save a Planet in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere you like to listen. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Synapse, thanks for listening.